follows that to the extent. <coughs> Today we have Chan Wei Chu, Professor Chan Wei Chu, who has a very distinguished record in quantum chromodynamics. In fact, I can say that he is one of the world's experts in QCD. In every element of QCD, he does the lattice, he does the perturbative parton stuff, he does the factorization. One of the only people in the world who does all everything. Chan Wei had a, a PhD from Columbia in 1987 under Al Mueller, who I guess you would argue was perhaps the world expert on QCD in those days and still today. He then went to, as a postdoc to Argonne, High Energy Physics Division, and uh, the State University of Stony Brook. He was a professor at Iowa State University, our neighboring university, 1991 until 2010. 2010, he went to Brookhaven National Lab, and he had a joint appointment there with Stony Brook. Stayed there at Brookhaven National Lab until he moved to uh, Jefferson National Laboratory in 2017, 16, and 2016 for J Lab. And since 2017, he has been uh, uh, the governor's uh, distinguished professor of physics at the College of William and Mary. So, without too much more fanfare, we'll hear about nuclear femtography and a new frontier of science and technology. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much for inviting me. I told uh, I had a good time to meet a number of you and then uh, had lunch with a student, really enjoyed it. I visited here many, many years ago. This is my third trip. Every trip I came back, you know, I enjoy it, talk to people. Then I know John for many years. So today, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to share with you something I spent a lot of time in the last 10 years. That was a part of the reason I moved from a university position to the national lab. Although I have a joint appointment with the university, but I spend most of the time in the national lab, which I don't like that much. There are too much politics and the paperwork. Yeah. Anyway, this is an effort to see if the US can take a leadership in collider physics. We know we lost our leadership to CERN in many aspects. And so this is an uh, effort. We lost the effort, you know, leadership in the energy frontier. So this machine, in some sense, we try to propose, we have probably the best, highest luminosity machine, and also precision, can really CAT scan, not that your head, when you went to hospital, had a concussion or something, to CAT scan the proton and the nuclei with one-tenth of res Fermi resolution. So this certainly will start a new frontier of science technology. So I will tell you why we can do that, why other machines in the world, even with upgrade, cannot do that. OK? So that's a summary of my talk. So let me start it, because I should say, when I look at your website, I was very much like the statement given here. I understand the universe starts from here. Very good. So I changed my slides. I start my talk with universe. So let's ask a few questions. So where did we come from? How did a hadron emerge from energy and the quarks room? Because now we see all the people in this room. But at the beginning of the universe, temperature is so high, you never see any human. So the only thing you might have in strong interaction is the quarks gluon in the very early part of the universe. So then the question is how the hadrons emerged from this energetic quarks and gluons. And also, what are we made of ourselves? We all know we're made of DNA, all these things. The question is, when you go inside the molecule, you will see the atom go inside, you have nuclear. Nucleus, then of course, now we find a, a, a proton, neutron, inside proton, neutron, have a quarks and gluons. How can we quantify? These. Why these things, quarks, gluon, eventually combine together, uh, bind together to form the proton neutron? What is the structure inside? We don't know after all these years. And it, what holds us together after all these years? Then, you know, we all learn something quarks, gluon move relativistically. 
how can the relativistic motion, the movement of the quarks go on? They can bind together, so tight together. What holds them together? So we know in the standard model, we all talk about Higgs particle. We discover every single particle of this table. But what I wanted to emphasize in my talk is something we still don't understand well about standard model initiated by this guy, the gluon. How the gluon plays the role to hold all of us together. Then, so nuclear photography, as I emphasized earlier, is really trying to search for answers to these questions at the Fermi scales. So then, how can we go ever, go, ever go back to time to see early universe? We never can do that. Universe expand. You never can squeeze them back. We don't have more energy to squeeze them back. But we all know in this department, you have a group who work at L2C, used to work at the RIC. What they do, relative caveat collisions. Ideas are very simple. I cannot squeeze the universe back, but what if I can produce in the laboratory something small, but at least have same or even high energy density? Then how that system cool down, quarks, gluons eventually become the hadrons into your detectors. Then try to understand the emergence of the hadron, as well as see whether or not you can discover the new state of the matter in the early universe. So, but the whole process can be summarized in one sentence. It's a virtual journey of visible matter. You start with the heavy ion, which is a visible matter. You collide. They form core gluon medium, which cannot see. Nobody sees core gluons in isolation. The eventual system cool down. You only see the hadron. So it's a virtual journey, but you try to see something you unsee, never see. How can we do that? Well, let me summarize. This is a phase diagram for strong interactions. We leave here the, the unit one for the nuclei. Then when you put the lots of energy in the heavy ion collisions, then you excite the system. All the protons, when they collide, have sufficient energy to produce a pion, produce a physical state. So you end up with a, a pi eventually observed in your detector. But what's interesting is once you put all that energy in, the system will heat it up to the region you think only quarks grew on, you may find the discovery. What the property of this, as you learn from the New York Times or many articles, there's a perfect fruit people ever found. The question you never see that. You never directly measure that. You only measure hadrons and the leptons. How to connect these two? We know you have to understand emergence of hydron from these. If the system forms into equilibrium, we know if the system forms equilibrium, they forget about past. But however, if the system does not form equilibrium, then you will be sensitive to the initial state. In that case, you have heavy ion to collide. So what is the platonic structure of hydron to start with? Initial condition of your collisions. Both are fundamental questions. The structure of the hadron and the emergence of the hadron. Is there a facility we can answer these questions through the experiment? So the rest of my talk emphasize from atomic structure to the hadronic structure. They emphasize the great intellectual challenge for nuclear photography because we try to study the dynamics of quarks grew on why we never see quarks grow in isolation. Then what is the EIC? We talk about it. And what, what EIC can do and what other machine cannot do. Finally, give a summary and an outlook. When we never talk about structure, this is the picture you often see, especially when you talk to condensed metal colleagues. They will see structure. Well, there is a steel pictures. You have a salt, you have all this crystal. You can have a metal material, buckyball. You always have a picture of a nucleus. They have a relative position of a nucleus. Why? Because nucleus is so heavy, so localized, doesn't move fast. In, you could take a picture, you could speed light, then with much faster speed of the nucleus. So the motion of the nucleus is much slower than speed light. Whenever we talk structure, you can have this kind of steel picture or quote, even you know, molecule or the protein, they move. 
but they move so slowly. We find this because of Rutherford experiment over 100 years ago. Then the with, by scaring of the alpha particle on the nucleus in the, gold, in the foyer, then eventually what the important thing is in our experiment, I'm going to say, because you all know that, we want to know what do we learn. From that simple experiment, we find the nucleus is so tiny. Size of nucleus is less than one trillion. We know that our national deficit of debt, one trillion in volume of atom. If you put two atoms together to form a molecule, you can imagine how much open space you have. That's critical. That's exact the reason lead up to the nanoscience. Then also, because of quantum probability, you discover the quantum world. Then the message for this slide, I want to say you have an infinite opportunity to create, can improve the material you might be able to create. Then we all know that nanoscience, that technology, that basic idea is so simple, so early proposed, one of the case from Feynman said there is a pretty of room at the bottom because you have lots of space. You move the distance between nucleus a little bit, you can create different structures. That's a wonderful idea. But why the nanoscience only become a booming, get excited in recent years? Because we discovered a tool. We had a theory. Without tool, you could not do anything. So then, you all know we need a technology, a facility to advance. Now you have a theory about buckyball, you have a nanotube, a nano sheet, but the key is you had a facility to be able to see the structure, <coughs> facility to build up the structure, these kind of materials. Now even, remember the, a year ago, the Nobel Prize, not the last year, before last year, you have a virus. How can you see the structure? It's moving. Well, we can cool them down. We have a crying electron microscope. Cool them down, take a picture, you see the structure. So message is you need a three things for anything new. You need an idea, need a facility, and you need a money. Then the National Nanotechnology Initiative is exactly provide the initial money to support this initiative, and also we know the nanoscience dealing with the physics between one to 100 nanometer, where the quantum mechanics is relevant and important. So when I talk about fentoscience, keep in your mind, we need these three ingredients. Ideas, most important. Next, facility or technology, whether I'll be able to do that. Third, of course, we need a support in the money. Then, or we'll convince the people to give us money. Hadron structure. Hadron structure in the sense to think everything inside the proton or neutron, we're dealing with in the sense from a modern version of a rock surface experiment taking place about 50 years ago at a slack. The idea is you have an electron instead of an alpha particle collided with a proton. At that time, different model about the proton's internal structures. If you think of a proton as a more or less uniform distribution, or the think of inside proton, there is a localized quark, as the Gelman proposed. Now you will have different predictions. So discovery that if you think of the, the, this kind of picture, the scattering cross section and the momentum transfer will fall steeply, but in, instead, the data of the inclusive cross section doesn't fall that much. Then that exactly leads to the discovery of the point like a particle inside proton and the fat man called the protons, girl man of course called the quarks. Then they move relativistically, spin half. Then the key is it's a red, related to the theory called relativity theory. Then in their case, there are lots of quantum fluctuation. The proton number is not fixed. One thing I will emphasize again and again, key difference between the quantum mechanics and the quantum field theory, that the number changes all the time in the quantum field theory. For the quantum mechanical system, no matter how big it is, the number is fixed. Both quantum, 
then so important consequence that because everything moves relativistically, we never have a still picture for hadron's platonic structure. I gave you many examples why they cannot. First of all, I want to emphasize, give it, because this discovery, we actually find inside the proton, its number of the particle is quantum fracture all the time. So it, it's a picture is, uh, it's not that it's just a three quark like a quark model proposed, but what holds the quark together is a gluon of the color force known as the birth of QCD. I will tell you, give you an example what the key difference between the nano size and the fento size, why we can study that. So first of all, QCD, one slide quickly, you have a spin half fermion quark, spin one gluon like a photon, but it carried charge. Then that's simple Lagrangian. Everything comes from this Lagrangian. For comparison with the QED, only difference, key difference is that the gluon interact among themselves. That interaction changes the, the way to look at a strong interaction versus electromagnetic interaction. In that case, gluon interact with themselves, no quarks and gluon C in isolation. Then I'll give you an ex example. First, the, because the self interaction lead to a really the interact unprecedented interaction challenge, how do you probe the quarks and gluon dynamics? Quantify the hadron structure, study the emergence of the hadron. Those things are what we want to do. If we do not see quarks and gluons. Second, gluons are dark, does not carry electromagnetic charge. Second, it carry color. What immediate consequence? You know the QED. Photon does not carry charge immediate the interaction between charge. So you know that all the quantum mechanics, all the atomic structure, you can define a quantum orbit. There are lots of space, the electron moving around can define quantum orbits. In strong interaction, you never can define that because the gluon carry charge. So it's a mark. Uh, George, Howard George, I used to call this uh, heavy quark effector theory the brown mark because you never can separate between color charges because the gluon itself carry charge. So their color is fully entangled. That's a one key difficulty. And also, we got a helper. Someone to help us for this difficult problem, asymptotic freedom. The idea is when the interaction showed it at a short distance, closed up, the force becomes the weak because the strength of interaction depends on how you probe it. So at a short distance, interaction becomes so weak, we can have some kind of perturbed calculation to control the interactions we we'll be able to calculate. That leads to controllable perturbed calculation at the high energies. So that naturally connects the strong interaction to the high energy experiment. So we might be able to test the strong interaction because the force effectively weak at that scale. But how can we, we need a probe? Since we never see quarks gluon in isolation, we need a probe. How can you see quark? How can you see the gluon? Well, because this helper, because this asymptotic freedom, I gave you one example. We can have well-defined probe up to some approximation. Key is a controllable approximation. You never can calculate everything because of strong interaction, but at the high energy, with certain condition, you will be able to calculate things, make predictions within the controllable approximations. That's the message. So with the help of asymptotic freedom, we need a probe to see the quarks gluon. What is a probe? Well, imagine that you have a scattered electron scattered one the one proton, just like in 1968, 69, what they did at Fermilab. That scattering cross-section, everybody know, should be the square, proportional square of the scattering amplitude. Electron scatter with the proton by exchange of the photon, then square them. Hopeless. We don't know how to calculate this blob. Well, under the approximation, when the momentum transfer is so large, this interaction taking place at a such a short time and a short distance. 
So a square of this part interaction gave you effectively so-called platonic hard part. You can calculate this a short distance local interaction perturbatively within the perturbation theory. And the rest of the structure information in your proton is effectively frozen at the time scale of the collision. So you can factorize this cross section as a short distance collision as a probe. Then you can keep improve the precision of the probe by calculating high order correction. Then the rest of the amplitude square gave you the probability to find that active proton after that collision. That gave you the information of the structure. Of course, you made approximation. Approximation that related to the size of the collision, more of a Q compared to the size of the proton. So if this is a good approximation, you can neglect them, then you can relate this cross-section in terms of something you can calculate, and something give you the exact information of platonic structure. But you notice that everything related to square. You never can get a still picture. What you get is a quantum probability. In the strong interaction, whatever we can measure in terms of the structure, I will give many examples, all relate to quantum probability distribution. It's a matrix element of well-defined operators. So in that case, because of this picture, you know still picture of a hydron structures. The measurement relate to this whole approximation known as the factorization, relate to the cross-section single measurement is a probability, relate to product of two probability with a correction. So the factorization tell you that connect the measurement to the quantum probability distributions. In this particular case, we interpret that as a probability. Find the active quarks with the longitudinal momentum x around the direction p, transversal momentum kt. So that's exactly related to the matrix sum and the quantum probability. This is the way how we see the quarks grow on. We never see the whole story of quarks grow on. <coughs> Excuse me. We see under the controllable approximation that quantum probability distribution find them for single parton or two parton correlation. Sometimes if you do the single spin symmetry, you can even see the something related to correlation. Single parton correlated with two parton. Those are the quantum probabilities you, you can find in a strong interaction. You never get a still picture because everybody moves it relativistically. With that starting point, should, why should we believe that? Answer the yes. Because that factorization formula has been well tested in almost every strong interaction experiment. I gave you the picture from the LGC measurement say all the cross sections you can imagine, most of them, theory of the experiment compare in terms of the error. Only a no in this comparison is that probability to find active proton in the colliding proton beam, known as the proton distribution. They are universal. When you fix them in one experiment, you can use them to test other. So they find that you can find a uniform set, one set PDF, with a perturbed calculator your probe. You can fit all these measurement quantities with this kind of accuracies. So we trust that formalism. QCD works very well. Then the question is, that's good, but that only tested the dynamics at the distance scale much, much less than one-tenth of a Fermi. Because energy scale you observed is 10 GeV, 100 GeV, even 1,000 a, a TeV. That means the dynamics you tested is really in the asymptotic region. Because in the global fit, they use the data with the momentum transfer larger than 2 GeV. The question we now interested is more than that. We're interested in the region at all Fermi. That's the region where the bound state is. So then it, the idea is from a nano sign to fentanyl sign. We know the idea, basic idea, nano sign is a one to 100 nanometers. 
Now we're interested on the fentanyl side for the distance scale is one tenth to the tenth Fermi. Again, two order magnitude. All these relate to quantum probability of the operators. PDF is just one example. Why this range? i show you the plot. Now, if you look at the structure, atomic structure, that range is exactly corresponding to from the nucleus to the 2GV. Anything above that is, has been used in the global fit than in the pure asymptotic region. It is this region tell us how the bound state of the quarks, gluons are formed and their structures. And also including new XYZ particles. What are they? How all these bond state hold together? It is a gruel. It's a mystery particles. The in essence, understand the gruel that binds us is the next frontier in the standard model. Gruel are very oh, it's weird particles. That it's a massless, yet it's responsible for almost all the hydrogen mass. Because the quote unquote mass on a few MeV compared to GeV. And also it carries color, unlike the photon, because that you don't have isolated quantum orbits, just like atomic structures. Then also responsible for color confinement, at the same time, also responsible for asymptotic freedom. Seem to be completely opposite features. In addition, another discovery from Harold, the number of gluons inside the proton skyrocket. When the gluon momentum becomes soft and soft, inside the proton, you have lots and lots and lots of soft gluons. It's a mini body problem. Condensed metal physics. What the, do they form a uni, universal feature, whether it's inside proton or inside the nucleus? So those are the questions we'd like to understand. Without the gluons, there would not be no, there would not, there would be no hadrons, no atomic nuclei, no visible world. To understand the strong traction, we have to understand gluons. Okay? So then that machine I proposed, Jefferson Lab, I will tell you in a moment, is corresponding to this region of phase space to probe in terms of the structure of the quarks, gluons. The one we really try to understand the gluon is electron ion colliders. So with this, let's say, why electron ion colliders? There are lots of hydronic machines. Well, we have E plus minus, best clean machine from <coughs> Japan. E plus minus machine is wonderful, very precise, but you don't have hydron to start with. Only thing you have in the final state is a hydron. Observed, that means you'd, there's no way for you to study the hydron structures. Instead, you can study the, how the hydron are emerged from energies, quarks, gluons. And what about LGC? We start with the proton. Well, in that case, every experiment you do, except the very limited diffractive experiment, you claw, you break the proton. When the proton is broken, the collision information and the structure information will mix together. From observable, you have to find a way to separate them, get you really the structure information. Then for the LTC, you have a TV energy compared to mass of a proton. Too much energy to completely shower the tremendous, to overshadow the, all the structure informations. That's the reason you only need to know part of probability distribution. Then what high energy scattering machine? can give you a process of, to keep the proton intact so I can cascade it layer by layer to understand structure. That's EP machine, lepton hydron machine. Hard collision without breaking the initial state hydron so you can have a chance to study special images. One example at the Jefferson lab, you have a lepton hydron facility. You have a continuing electron beam, which has probably the world's best high intense electron beam in terms and all high energies. So in, think about the luminosity. We talk about luminosity at LGC, high lum LGC. I gave you a number, you go back to look at it, you will be shocked. What the luminosity we talk at the 
Jefferson lab. First, it's a fixed target. By improving your target, you can have higher luminosity. Even with that, 10 to the 38. Think about it. What's the luminosity for LGC high luminosity version of it? 10 to the 38. If you differ by three or four order magnitude, if you do one year experiment, they do 100 years or 1,000 years or more. So that's the luminosity. That was, we just went through $350 million upgrade, DOE sign up, then it's a $350 million. So now the machine is running. What's unique about this machine? EP machine. EP machine, you can do different type of experiment. One type of experiment says, so inclusive event, I don't even look at a hydronic final state. Only thing I do is scatter electrons and the angle of the electrons. That's it. With the measurement of scatter energy, scattering angle, I can learn already the platonic structure like a pattern distribution. In that case, there is single scale. Well, if you have a hard single scale, one scale, it's true you will pick up a platonic nature of the quarks drawn, but you're not sensitive to the confining structure, which is a much softer scale. Well, with this machine, by looking for a specific final state, I can look for a semi-inclusive event. To, instead of an electron, I can measure a pi on k on proton or jet in the final state. I can show you in a moment, for this kind of collision, naturally, the momentum, transverse momentum of that particle you observe, in a photon hydron frame, it's almost zero. It's very small. So observable involving two scale. One is a very large Q, which localize your collision to see the particle nature of the quarks gluon. Then that small scale gives you the opportunity to see the confined motion of the proton or special imaging of the proton inside proton. So it is that feature allow us to do the experiment to see the structure of the hydron. You cannot do it in a hydron machine. Then also, you can do the exclusive event. Say, I try to see every single particle in the final state. I give you an example. You can do the tomography, just like you have an x-ray going through your head to see the imaging of your brain there. So that machine is exactly the sharpest CT ever you can imagine, imaging the quarks wrong structure without the break in the proton. Then with the Q square we control, we can have a resolution one-tenth of Fermi. And also to discover the color confined radius, see how far the color correlation is. They can find inside the nucleon, or they can spread over to nucleus. That's crucial. You know, the old discussion about the middle of the central neutron star, how the core gluon can form uh, crystal structures that require the BCS type of the super color superconductivity. That require long range coloration. If the color is very localized, what are you going to do? So then also, it's a giant microscope to see the core grew on by breaking the proton. I can most events, I can break the proton. The, uh, the photon quantum fracture, the QQ bar pair, going through the proton can break it. With the, the probe is all the one of a cube, much less than one tenth of them. So in that case, I can discover or study color entanglement and to study nonlinear dynamics of the group. So that's a machine. Then uh, it's a war effort. The, the early we had a third, a uh, hero machine, which is a closed. That machine did not achieve what it wanted to achieve, even though it has high energy, because the luminosity is low. Then the US, that, the soon they have a proposed LGEC in a much higher energies. But US have two proposed, proposal, one from uh, Brookhaven, one from JLab. They cover the more or less same energy region, similar uh, physics they want to approach, but the way different <coughs> design. I'll give you an example, but also the other machines. In the US, to get this proposal, get people interested, get the funding agency interested, it goes through a long process. The Tim Holman, the associate director for the uh, Office of Science in charge of nuclear physics, say typically about 20 years for any major machine in the US. That is correct. So in this case, for this uh, start of the 2007 long range plan, the officially, the first time, say electron ion collider with a polarized beam, has been brought by US nuclear science community and reach the vision to reach the next QCD frontiers. Then the most important is the 2015 long range plan to recommend build this machine as a highest priority right after completion of FRIP. Recently, most important, if you want to spend that much money, 
to convince the Congress, you need real support from the National Academy of Science because they represent a body of scientists. So, so their review just released end of uh, some of last year's. This machine will answer science questions that are compelling, fundamental, and timely, and help maintain U.S. scientific leadership in nuclear physics. And also, they pose, they answer three profound questions. Those are fundamental. How does the mass of nucleon arise? How does the spin of nuclear arise? I will explain why this machine can help that, and how, what are the emerging property of this dense system gluon? Because we find inside the proton there are a huge number of gluons. Then in the US, there are two, two options. Brookhaven machine take advantage of current Rick, try to build another electron ring inside the machine. And also, JLab is a designer. So it's a figure A machine, which can preserve the polarization. You all know the polarization we possess inside the magnetic field. When you have figure A, you self-correct it after go around the circle, so you can preserve the polarization. So the physics, two labs have been proposed these, have been debated about it, which one is the better, but of DOE effective told two labs, don't fight. Only chance you have, work together, make a science case. So that was the reason I moved from university to the lab. So then we put together a white paper, which is actually the basis for this long range plan, as well as this uh, National Academy review. So in terms of the luminosity emphasized, this machine, you can see in terms of the collider, the fixed on it, JLab, is here, 10 to the 38. But in terms of the collider, this is the machine where have high luminosities. Then why this machine can answer the questions Hero had a mission. They stopped. Why didn't they try to push it further, upgrade to have that? Well, important. First of all, this machine can do so-called quantum imaging. You can have a sufficient high luminosity to find enough event, proton is staying intact. Because Hero discovered 15% of the time, EP events are defective and the proton not broken. Because the US mission design with 100 to 1,000 times the luminosity, which is critical for this kind of observable, then from the de facto process, by exchanging the T, the de facto momentum transfer, Fourier transfer that gave you exact imaging. I will give you an example in a moment. Second thing is why Hero cannot do. You can study quantum interference and the quantum entanglement directly in the experiment because of the spin. Remember, if you measure a single measurement, a cross-section, no matter how complex dynamics is the quantum, but single observed measurement is a classical. It's a probability, cross-section. But if I measure difference of two cross-section with some parameter change, or condensed matter colleagues say, if I measure correlation, you will see quantum effect. So example, if, uh, if I measure a single a collision with a proton is polarized, but proton is transverse polarized. Then you can have a cross section for observe the particle, say pi. What would really happen in the quantum field theory, you add all the amplitude, have a semi initial state, semi final state, then square them. But in the most high energy case, pulling multiple particles at the same place, you pay a penalty of the collision size over the hydrogen size. So this term often is suppressed because of the high energy collision. But what if I measure a difference of two cross section with a spin flip? That first term, because of the collinear approximation, they actually canceled it in the difference. So what you measure immediately, directly by taking the difference of two cross section, is the quantum interference in the strong interaction. You can see when you have flip a spin, in the factor interaction, never can change your helicity. How can you flip the spin between amplitude and the complex conjugate amplitude? Well, if the amplitude involving a single hydron have a given holistic, complex conjugate the quark will have the same holistic. But if you measure the quark gluon composite state, gluon with a spin in the opposite direction, the combination of the two particle composite state will have opposite spin or holistic compared to an amplitude with a single spin. Their measurement exactly gave you quantum interference of a two-particle state with a one-particle state 
that quantum matrix element of probability distribution does not have real probability, tra traditional probability. It's a quantum interference. That because Hero never had a spin, never had a polarized beam, proton beam. You never can do that. Third, then nonlinear nuclear uh, quantum dynamics. And I mentioned when the gluons are so dense, <coughs> if you want to see the interaction, the color correlation lens, answer the simple question inside the nucleus. The gluon in one nucleon, does that gluon communicate with the color of the gluon in the back of the nucleus? The nuclear in the back. It's a quant if there is any quantum correlations. We know nuclear physicists say, well, by exchanging pi on the sigma, all the particles give you the nucleus. But all the pi on sigma are made of the quarks the gluon. So I impose the question when I talk to FRP, we have a one day brainstorm, how these two facilities can dialogue. To, they say, what the nucleus look like if I have detected only C quarks the gluon? No pi on, no proton, no neutron. That's exactly the fundamental question of the strong interactions. Then in that case, without the nucleus being, nuclear beam as a hero, they cannot study this physics. It's difficult. So those are the three things. I use the rest of my time to give a few more examples. Uh, what do the existing facility, even with upper, cannot do the same? The many things due to time, I only give a couple of examples. Then you will find more. So first, the emerge of the hydro. When the quarks and gluon are produced, they eventually become a hydrogen into a detector. Quarks and gluon all carry color. How the color neutralize? They must take place at the range of the confining lens. So all the Fermi's. In the real life, you never detect it at all the Fermi. How can you ever have chance to see the detail of the emerge of the hydrogen? Well, with the nuclear beam, nucleus itself can play the role as a femtometer sized detector. So by studying the scattering with the ice, because you have electron scatter, uh, oops, proton, you control the kinematics, how the system goes through a nuclear media, become the pi in the detector, depend on how the system interacts with the medias. So there are different models, that like you can pi on production, different models you can imagine, have a different suppression in the nuclear because of the interaction. But actually, if you look at heavy particle, like a D meson, all these things, you will find, in this case, there's a chance of enhancement. Because the hydronization process are very different. Anyone interested in detail, I can tell you, this is one of the prediction, day one measurement. If you measure that, you will find, help you understand the neutralization. And also, you can apply this to hydrogen ion collisions, look at the particle on the transfer side. It's like a rotational process of this. So this thing will be cross-checked. So this tells you the, how the hadrons emerge from a quark gluons. Second is the mass and the spin. Those are fundamental properties, and a microscopic property of the bound state. How they connect it with the microscopic internal dynamics. So we all know the mass is nothing but just energy of the particle when the particle at the rest. Then a, a spin is angle momentum of the particle when the particle at the rest. In the field theory, we have well defined the operator in the energy momentum tensor with angle momentum uh, operator. So you can define the mass and spin uniquely inside the field theory. The question is how to connect it to experiment. So how do we understand it in terms of core ground dynamics? Even though we know the mass of protons about GeV spin the half. So if we don't understand proton mass spin, we don't know QCD. It's very, very important. So the mass for the proton, in the sense people say it's a mass without mass. We know the Higgs produced is responsible for generation of fermion mass. But the Higgs is responsible for generation of mass of a quarks, but compared to mass of protons, they're nothing, a few, just a few percent. So Higgs max is not enough. As a long range plane in this uh, new, uh, insect, say the specific uh, vast majority of nuclear mass due to the quantum fluctuation of the core anti quark pair and the gluon, and the energy associated with quarks moving around at a close the speed of light. The question is, how can you tell that? How can you measure that? So how to quantify these and verify these theoretically and experimentally? So then we know, look at a, I gave a, a simple example for the student. 
then we all know dynamics, at least you test the self consistency from asymptotic freedom to the confinement to range. The dynamic scale we know is the lambda QC order roughly about 1 over Fermi, about 200 mV. That's what we know the scale. From these, can you find strong interaction, at least the self consistent? The size of the proton is more or less consistent with its mass. That take a simple problem, a student can do it. Uh, back of envelope from back model, you have a kinetic energy of three quarks bound together by the back energies. The kinetic energy is three quarks, then you have the back kinetic energy. Then, without any difficulty, you immediately realize the mass of a proton is self consistent with the size of the proton as well as number of valence quarks. If you have a four or two, you are in trouble. And also, can two quark model, of course, with assumption with the 900 mV. The lattice calculation, they show that picture where the mass is stored inside proton. We don't know. But the lattice people did put the three quark together on top of each other, although not the physical mass is sufficiently larger than the real one, but let them move. They will move apart, eventually stable. Then you find the junction dominate, that means most energy is stored in the middle. If this is true, the gruon, effective radius of the gruon density will be much smaller than the density of the quarks. That's something you want to test. After they say, Lattice already told us they can calculate from QCD, they found a mass, gave a few parameters, fixed uh, parameters in the Lagrangian, like a current quark mass. Then you will find that you can really predict the spectrum with the measurement, even including excited state. The different points corresponding to different fermion action. You know, when you discretize the QCD, you have a different fermion action, depending on how you discretize it. They are self consistent. Then the question is that's a black box. How does QCD generate this? The role of the quarks versus that of gluons. That's important questions. So you then look at the field theory. What do we have? Energy momentum tensor from QCD. It's well defined. If I take a trace of any the momentum tensor, you will find you only have two terms. Then sandwich this inside proton state, you proportional to mass square. So mass of proton related to the trace, proportional trace of energy momentum tensor. Now you immediately realize the term you survive, trace anomaly, that's a purely quantum effect of a gluon, then car symmetry breaking. So in some sense, hydrogen mass is directly connected to gluon the quantum effect and a car symmetry breaking. Some people prefer one. They say, oh, everything generated by car symmetry breaking. Some people prefer other, everything generated by gruon energies. Let's do the experiment to measure it. Then that will be connected to measure the bond state near threshold. Then that measurement will give you the information on the trace anomaly. The lattice calculation also can calculate this, but they cannot calculate this yet. So from JLab 12 to yeah, JLab already have ex proved the experiment to measure J psi near the threshold. Since J psi is not heavy enough, then the contamination by a multi gluon state. So it's better to do EIC, look for upsilon near the threshold, dominated by the two gluon. You might be able to see the trace anomaly. And also lattice calculation try to decompose that into different pieces of a contribution as a sum rule. You know, some rule is only interesting or variable if individual term can be measured independently through the experiment, which is hard. And there is a certain uncertainty. I'm not going to spend much time on it. Instead, I want to emphasize, understand the proton mass. It's not only US. It's an international effort. We recently had a couple of uh, workshops from a website. You can find more detail, more discussion. The idea is to combine, I would say, the three prong approach including lattice QCD, mass decomposition, and the model calculation. Model calculation is not necessarily bad. Some of my colleagues don't like it. Well, you know what's your assumption. If you do not fit, then the assumption have a problem. So this is the world effort. What about spin? We all know spin half. Well, we know the angle momentum operator. You can decompose into core content, gluon content, sandwiched between the proton state. So that including the quark part, gluon part. Then of course, then we learned a lot through the last 30 years. Then we have a holistic contribution, have a gluon contribution. Then we find that so far, the holistic contribution from quark more or less stable is about 
then the uh, gluon is uh, within the range we have a measure is about 40 percent then for the region and orbit angle momentum we don't know much about that it's a uh, it's open but I will tell you this machine can help us to pin down this part so then with this machine what you can do the current that world data on polar you do the spin you like to polarize the proton when you polarize the proton the data is very limited but with this machine as a simulation you can have lots and lots more data to the scale dependence you can probe even though electromagnetic probe you only see the charge of the quark you don't see ground directly but through the scale variation you change the probing energy you can see the effect of the ground by doing so JLab will be able to measure things in the large X region with this kind of accuracy, pushes the momentum fraction all the way to 0.8 EIC with the one year running. Even though we don't know exactly how much contribution from a quark, how much it function from gluon, from a central value, but we know the statistical error has been this small. Even the central value can move, but the error is this small compared to current data. We will nail this down. So no other machine in the world can achieve that. And an optimal solution, if you find this somewhere, then you cannot, from a holistic contribution to the proton speed, then the motion is a critical important to contribute to the proton spin. Kinesis metal people always say, oh, how can you do that? The fractional spin. Everything is a superposition of a spin half, spin one particle. Well, in the strong interaction, number of particles are not fixed quantum fracture all the time. Only thing you measure is a probability distribution to find that. So then, how can you see the motion? As I mentioned, you need an observable with two scale. Larger scale to pin down the particle degree freedom of the quark screw on. Small scale gave you information of the motion, all the, the confining features. So this is exactly what we require observable with two scale. So because the collision is so localized, compared to size of the proton, if you can localize the collision point and measure transverse motion, you can see the confined motion, see this point, you can see the image and probability to find the quark screw on at the given point. Can we do that? Answer is yes, with this machine. The idea is that if you do semi encoded DIS, you measure the hydro in the final state, in the frame between photon and proton, it is dominated by a region Q squared much larger than PT. It's observable, so natural, gave you two scale. So that, and also, this is a confined motion. Then you can do the exclusive process. You measure the proton without broken. By momentum transfer between these, that's a T. Natural process, Q squared much larger than T. Fourier transform of the T like a form factor, gave you exactly the image, how they distribute. So with that said, Theoretical background, you have, since you never see quarks grow, now you have a multiple scale observable. Can you have a theory match what you measure in the real experiment detector and what happened at a platonic level? And so yes, in the last 15 years, there are a lot of theoretical development. So now we are confident we are ready to do this experiment. So they connected to so-called theories of solid. They have unified distribution with a so-called Wigner distribution connected to the confined motion or transverse momentum PDA polon distribution, really confined motion or generalized polon distribution gave a special image. And give you an example just quickly. Theory is solid. Give an example of semi cool DIS. Depending on the region of the phase space you observe, you have corresponding factorization formula all proved to all order with uh, controllable approximations. And also, because of spin, we like to understand the global property of the spin, how they connect it to platonic dynamics. One observable I mentioned is the difference of two cross section with spin split. That relates to so-called Sivers effect. They give you the quantum correlation between hydron spin direction and the parton motion. The idea is if the proton is being polarized this way, proton will have preference. Different flavor have different preference. You will find up quark will prefer to move in one direction compared to down quarks. So that correlation is exactly quantum effect connected with the protonic motion with the hydronic property. 
And also you can hydronization. If the parton has a spin in the one direction, you will find when they hydronize to the pion or the particle, they prefer one direction than others. So that's known as a coiling effect. So this is exactly quantum inter correspondence we can measure this with this machine. Some simulation for EIC, you will find for the transfer price, the proton in the y direction, if you look at beam in the z direction, the up quark favor in the one side, large kx, then down quark in the other side. So that needs to be tested. What about special imaging? I mentioned promised you have special imaging. We know how to measure proton radius, charge, electromagnetic charge radius. We measure form factors. But in the strong traction, you never can measure elastic form factor. Because the gluon carry charge. When the proton absorbs one gluon, you don't have proton anymore. You can absorb the photon, you still have a proton. So you have a form factor. Gluon, you cannot do that. So what do you do? Well, in the strong interaction, we measure the probability. Instead of one gluon, exchange either a pair of gluon or a pair of quark anti quark pair. In that case, it's related to the probability rather than direct form factors. So we measure by exchanging a virtual photon, produce a virtual photon by exchanging quark anti quark pair, known as deep virtual competence scaring. Virtual photon with a proton to the real photon proton. You can, with the simulation, you can see the accuracy of that measurement. Fourier transfer of that T depends give you exactly the probability distributions. Even go to the scale of the one Fermi where the pi cloud is supposed to be responsible for your proton. Then how do you find the quark content in that? That gives you the effective radius of a proton in terms of the quark distributions. So you can define the proton radius in very different ways. So far, we talk about proton radius in terms of electromagnetic charge. What about the proton radius in terms of the quark distribution? What about proton radius in terms of gluon distributions? Well, you measure the probe, the coconium, dominated by two gluon exchange. In that case, you directly measure the distribution of the gluon density. You gave the proton radius of the gluons as a function of the momentum fractions. Now we know why I care, why I get the radius interesting. Well, that directly related to confining mechanism. You know the picture of the proton depends on who you talk to. Back models say, well, valence quark moving around by back pressure. In that case, you expect a gluon radius larger than charge radius. Now if the constituent quark is uh, say, OK, gluon just quantum fracture around the valence quark. So you would expect it is similar. Remember I mentioned to you the last simulation, they emphasized all the junction picture, the gluon sitting in the between. In that case, you expect a gluon radius much less than charge radius, which is the same like a quark. We like to measure it. We want to see it. So the 3D confining motion that's related to TMD, special distribution related to GPDs, give you the hint on the color confining mechanism. So I take the last minute or so, a few minutes, I'm sorry for delay, then I tell you another important feature is that running of a gluon density small x. Why do you keep running? Because we know this mechanism, gluon radius. Keep radius, you remember, get more and more gluon at the small, small momentum fraction. When the density is so high, gluon will meet each other to recombine. So these two dynamic crosses have to be balanced. We remember this quant color entanglement, small x. You have this picture. Remember, we have this correction. Those corrections related to power suppressed is exactly related to the particles combined together. So you, when, when you find these, then you have to include this term. Once you study the Q-square depending on the precision, you can help you to understand the mechanism of these. And also, if you find every term is equally important, counting individual particles is meaningless. You better to have new variables. Because every term is equally important. You have to sum to infinity. That's known as saturation. So every term is equally important. You have to choose a new degree of freedom instead of a single point like parton. So that, then how can we test it? This is a part of the QCD question is where to find it. There was expectation is that about 10 to minus 5 depending on scale 5 GeV. People push this to low, low scale so you can move this axis a little bit smaller. But there is a way to test it. To finish this, I gave you a thoughtful experiment. You can do that day one. Simple experiment. The experiment is the following. I'm going to use a larger nucleus. 
The idea is that at the fixed impact parameter, the photon, the probe, is a small scale. You see the particle nature the, in the transfer side, but the longitudinal side, because of Lorentz contraction, is, the, is no longer localized. Inside the proton, not the nuclear, if you sit there, the probe is spread in the longitudinal direction. So in that case, the probe can see gluon from all the nucleon at the same impact parameter coherently. So what happened is, imagine the nucleus, you can have a gluon from all self contacted by you know, nuclear force. The question is, what does a nu looks nuclear? Does the color of A knows color of a B? That's a very fundamental question. Can you test that? If it's a no, that means observe the nuclear effects, the purely coherent collision effect, because you collide with the individual one, just like you add more nuclear at your beam. If it's a yes, nucleus will act like a big proton at a small act. That means the color coherence is long. That really impacts your understanding of a color confinement. Yet, I gave you a thoughtful experiment. Simplest measurement you could ever do. Say, structure function, F2, total cross-section. You, we all know from a CERN measurement or Fermilab measurement, measure cross-section of the calcium, of a deuteron, they have that, such a very interesting feature, the ratio is not one, even though bonding energy is just a mgv per nucleon. The scale to exchange stop here of a 1 GV square. The question is what happened afterwards? Because current data can only stop there. You can have two scenarios. One scenario, they're getting flat. But we know the denominator is in the deuteron proton. They're not saturated. So that means pro the nucleus uh, distribution, the proton in the nucleus, nuclear inside nucleus, behave the same as in the nucleon, uh, individual nucleon. That means there is no real saturation. The color is localized inside proton. If they keep going, then the nucleus act uh, like a big proton. So what you measure is exactly, in this case, corresponding to the color is localized inside individual nucleon. This suppression is a geometrical feature because you interact with multiple nuclei coherently. But this corresponding to the color is overlapped. So the color know each other. You have a long range of color correlation. So keep the surprise until the flat where the proton is saturated. So that's exactly the day one experiment, measure cross-section. Then EIC is the big story. Then we know that EIC international effort. We have a user group that so far we have almost uh, more than 700 collaborators, 29 countries all over the world. Let me summarize. EIC is an automated QCD machine to discover and to explore the core ground structure and a property of hydrogen on the nuclei. Read to search the hint. We cannot prove it theoretically. The confinement, crew for the confinement, and to measure the quantum fluctuation and a color neutralization. I didn't have time to talk much. Then also I want to emphasize US EIC although not the high energy as the LGEC, is really sitting in the sweet spot. See the transition of these features. Once you're really in the saturated region, it becomes a classical system. Its transition is the most interesting part. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I had a couple minutes more. Yeah. JLab and Rick have competing proposals, as you mentioned. Uh, are the, the physics that you discuss here equally accessible with both? Excellent questions. So I tell you, since I'm <laughs> editor for the white paper, <laughs> I gave you a simple example. There was a very long, you know, DOE every 20 years there's a long range of plan. Every facility over $100 million have to be online. So I gave a talk about EIC. My talk in the first talk in the afternoon, 2 o'clock in the morning, my slides was not fixed because I gave it to his, my draft slide two weeks in the event, I gave it to both labs because they have strength from each side. So they want to balance. At the end of the day, what we did, there is a table of parameters. No matter which design, you have, you have to achieve that to be able to access most important part of physics. So that table is in the white papers. So that's exactly a Tobol's lab. That's the number I'm going to use in my presentations. So there is a small difference. The JLab machine, because figure A design, is extremely good for spin. Then uh, Fermilab, uh, not Fermilab, sorry. <laughs> Some people know what I mean. <laughs> then the Brookhaven design, because it's an older hadron machine. So the, they have to build a new electron. 
they initially have a Linux, so have a high luminosity, but that failed. Now they do the circular version. But the old hydronic machine, it's a luminosity issue. Brookhaven have high energy, but it's an issue of luminosity, how, how much you can increase. Then JLab because has the best electron machine, but you don't have a hydron. Have to build a new hydron machine. Advantage of that, you start as new, so you can build a better machine, but on the hands are more expensive. So it, both sides have uh, issues. So the only thing I told Tim Holm and Dio yes, as jo a joke, I said, I'm a theorist. Only thing I care, build a good machine. So <laughs> because this is probably the only machine for the next 30 years that Tim told me that they're probably the next 50 years. So you also are interested as a theorist as to when the machine comes online. That's are right. both proposals Same. equally competitive in terms yes. of when they yes. become online? Yes, exactly. They have a little interference with the current construction or cu current operation. In the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of emphasis on uh, deep and elastic scattering using muons. Okay. Um, why is that no longer interesting? I guess it's maybe a little just luminosity. You have to have the beam. Yeah. Then the, uh, the, the Fermi lab, you know, the Fermi lab have a muon beam. They produce uh, this uh, fixed target experiment. Beam come from the vector hydro machine. So here, the hydro machine is uh, low energy compared to Fermilab energy. So you never get a high energy muon beam. Let me ask a question differently. Is there any, was there much in the way of specific uh, better measurements associated with muons compared to electrons, or was it all very much? Oh, similar? Similar. yeah. At least uh, if you think of universality. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yes. I hope you convinced you convinced the congressman to pay the money to build the machine. <laughs> well, what is the current status in terms of actually getting this approved and sure. they at my understanding the DO is still debating about the procedure of a site selection. So they were try to have since uh, National Academy of Science endorsed this machine very strongly, so they were thinking about to have a CD zero. At the moment, uh, EIC is not even a project in DOE. They only put the side, some money for the accelerator improvement, then uh, R&D. But they try to have a CD zero sign part, sign part first. The initial talk about end of this year or early next year. But after CD zero, the project's officially established in DOE, then they will try to have a side choice, side decision about CD one. Yeah. So, but it's a hard process. Yeah. Suppose we're selling this to congressmen or the public, and, and we say that the machine is a beautiful instrument. The machine goes into a new era because of polarization and high luminosity that Hera never could explore. So you have a, a technical uh, innovation, a technically wonderful machine. But then uh, suppose the congressman uh, knows theory. <laughs> <laughs> he says, that, why should I believe that the theory 10 or 20 years from now will be good enough to use this kind of data. Because at the moment, the theory is not that good. <coughs> we have a lot of, we have, we have an exact Lagrangian, we have a quantum theory, but we can't do theory to the extent to be able to predict or test most of these observables. Why would we believe it's going to be better 20 years from now? Well, uh, I, actually, let me put it in this way. If we believe QCD, we can make sufficiently good prediction or calculation. As I mentioned, theory of factorization have been proved for various observables. But of course, the things can be improved, that continue improved. And the QCD might fail at the long distance, could be absolutely correct in the short distance, but may have difficult in the long distance, or may behave differently. But that is so far gave us enough hint that QCD is the right theory, even at the long distance. So, Theory continue to improve. I think uh, what I emphasize in the last 15 or 20 years, we learned a lot for this new observable. We can control the theoretical calculations, but it never ends, right? You can always improve. It's a discovery machine. We want to discover new things. Like people say, most of machine, what you discover is not what you predict. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you.